Hello and welcome. This is Working Class to World Class. But before we go any further, I do have a little favour of you. If you could hit that follow or subscribe button, then that would be a massive help. Thank you. In this episode, I chat with a Northampton guy who tells me all about his success as a creative and he goes to prove that sometimes it's about being in the right place at the right time. Breaking through the barriers of adversity. I'm Lynn Lester and this is Working Class to World Class. James, it's always so good to catch up. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been we've been been doing this for a while. We've been catching up for a while. I know, I know. Well the thing is I think the, the time that we always catch up is some industry event where we've got a glass of vino and there's loud music, lots of dancing. I think those were the, the good old days. Absolutely. Yeah, so I feel like we have our deepest conversations usually on a stage uh, in front of like hundreds of people, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where you're picking up so many awards, which we'll talk about in a wee second. So to kick us off, who is James Cross? Uh, I am the, I am now, and this sounds a bit weird and I'll probably elaborate on this later, but a chief creative officer, I always feel very weird saying that, uh, uh, and founder at Miwa. Um, previous to that, I suppose we're best known as being creative directors of BBC Creative for five or six years. I work with uh, a chap called Tim Jones, who we've worked together for approaching 20 years, uh, which is my longest relationship by miles. <laughs> wow do you know i need to tell you a funny story when i started working in advertising yeah. and i would go around and meet like creative directors and they would keep they kept talking about their partners and the, who their partners are yeah. and, I, and at first i thought everybody was just gay like i didn't realize it was like the working oh, yeah, partner yeah. i was like oh okay this is a cool industry it's like oh now the penny drops right okay get it now <laughs> yeah it's great it's kind of it's like um it is like going to work with your best mate every day which is is amazing and uh al who is our sort of md chief chief ceo ceo uh, chief executive officer um it's uh, just it's it's so cool with just you should make around it's it's brilliant so yeah well see for people tuning in like obviously you're talking about your creative direct i mean there's a lot of people in the industry or a lot of people that are not in the industry that are going to watch this so my family my friends people overseas so do you want to explain what it is you actually do what are you chief creative yeah. officer of like what uh, well we were uh, so we're uh we call ourselves a creative company which is essentially an advertising agency so we make um television campaigns advertising campaigns posters radio uh, we do stunts, so we do sort of PR stunts for trying to get into newspapers, um, and we we just we j- sort of genuinely love what we do. It's kind of I think all three of us can't believe we get paid for it because I think we'd do it for fun if if we didn't, which I probably shouldn't say out loud. But <laughs> but yeah, we we love what we do, making stuff and and seeing your work out in the world is is yeah absolutely amazing. So. Yeah, it's uh, we're an ad agency, in, is the short answer, I guess. Cool. Well, that'll make a lot of sense to people. And the thing it's worth saying up front, so there's context to this conversation, is you are a multi-award winner. Like, you've won so many awards. I remember one award show I hosted, it was literally when you were at BBC, <laughs> every other category you were winning. People were like, is this thing rigged? Like, how come they're, they're winning so much? It's like, well, they're just so good. That's yeah. why. So. That was you weird. Know, you know, I get really, I actually get quite embarrassed when that sort of thing. I mean, it's only happened once or twice, which is once or twice more than most, I suppose, which is amazing. But um, yeah, we uh, not necessarily put a, a big uh, value on awards. I mean, they're great to have, but they're, they are the result of, you know, we have the, this attitude where we just need to work harder than everyone else. And we are super competitive and it probably comes down to, for Tim and I, we've got incredibly similar backgrounds. We grew up in towns, uh, sort of in the sort of Midlands area um, and had very similar experiences. And I think it's made us both, you know, we there's no complacency. We are sort of always trying to prove ourselves because it's, I suppose it's, uh, some sort of deep seated imposter syndrome where we have to do more. So, where some people, I suppose our approach is where some people stop and it's perfectly reasonable to stop and not do anything else or do things a certain way, we go and do the extra bit because that gets the, it makes our clients famous, which is most important. 
um, and then sort of we do quite well out of it and we build a career on it, I suppose. Do you know, you, there was a few trigger phrases and words there. So imposter syndrome, yeah. you work harder than anybody else. You never, I guess what you were saying is you're never racing your laurels and that yeah. absolutely comes back to your background. So that's where we're going now. This is how right. I do this. I'm going to take you back in time. Yeah, we're going to strip you. Right now, you're not a multi-award winner. You're right. just James. You're just yeah. a wee guy in the Midlands. So yeah. where did it all start? Like, where were you born? Uh, I was born in Northampton, which uh, is a, a bit of a sort of nowhere place, <laughs> really. It's kind of technically halfway between Birmingham and London. Um, it's an M- it's a motorway service station, I think most people know it as. But uh, it's uh, a town that there's... I think I always when I was younger, I always had a problem with it, and I was a little bit embarrassed by it. Um, as I get older, it's like a quirky thing to say. There's not... There's not loads of opportunity. It's kind of a, most people leave, or they kind of work in the sort of the, the factories and the, everything around around the town. So it's an incredibly I'd call it an incredibly average place, but that doesn't mean that I don't don't love it <laughs> as well. Yeah, and, and to be fair, most working you know working class sort of towns are like it's industrial. Yeah. People, are, as you mentioned, people are in factories and. You know, and, and you actually said something quite interesting, which I, I, we don't need to interrogate now. I'll interrogate a bit later, but you yeah. talked about how you were embarrassed of it. But we'll yeah. park that for a minute because I would love to, as you get older, how that sort of changed. But for now, can you sort of talk through your family setup? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, so I'm one of four kids. So I'm the second of four. So uh, my mum says I'm a typical second child and never quite, <laughs> never quite fitting in. And I suppose that's been... Uh, kind of the, the theme of the story really uh, but so uh my uh mum was born in hackney before it was gentrified when it was a uh frankly a bit of a dump in her words so uh her mum and dad um uh, my grandparents are both east london as well uh they my nan lived in uh grew up in a, what you describe as a slum i suppose uh, uh my granddad uh was uh, an irish immigrant into brick lane so the early brick lane it was you know all the sort of irish around uh and they moved out in i suppose what you describe as the london overspill so when my mum was sort of seven or eight in you know they took the people out of these sort of really run down places so they lived in a flat above a laundry uh, I moved up to Northampton, which was this sort of promised land, this new town, lots of sort of suburbia, really, which is where I grew up. Um, and then my dad, uh, he, his parents are from Rotherham and they were um, his mum's family were railway people. So they used to be uh, my great grandfather was a signalman. So they kind of moved down the railway. So when there was a new job, he got a house with a job. So they ended up in Northamptonshire. Um and yeah, that's that's kind of my background. So my my folks for work, my dad, um, my dad uh, was started off as a, a car mechanic, so like in back street garages. Um, uh, he often talks about getting sacked in the morning, and you know doesn't go home until he finds another job somewhere. Yeah. Dad, I suppose calling him a bit of a he's not like David Jason, but he's a bit of a Del Boy where he can talk his way into stuff he can he's very capable you know not highly educated but um uh, he's kind of clever with how he can you know uh there's a story he used to tell about a brake pipe which was steel it would take him ages to bend it into shape then worked out that if he just got a bit of copper piping he could do it in half the time and charge a client just as much so it's a bit of ducking and diving um so uh and my mum is a nursery nurse um, uh, and that's what she's kind of always done uh, around and they, they've done so many jobs. So my dad's business went bust in 1992, which was a really scary time, uh, for me growing and probably, you know, with various therapists, I found out that was kind of a, such a key moment and stuff. Um, so he's done sort of all sorts. So they, my parents got into uh, car boot sales suddenly became their main source of income and but not just like selling random stuff out of the back of the house or whatever like it was a proper industry where they were buying and selling so if they could buy something for 50 pence and sell it for five quid at the weekend that was kind of the way 
it worked for a long time at that sort of recession time, early 90s. My dad then moved into selling um, like scale electric cars and Hornby trains, but buying people's collection. And then so a lot of buying and selling is kind of throughout the family. Um, and my mum helped out uh, even to the point where I think my, they reached a point maybe about 10 years ago, and just before my dad was retiring. My parents are, uh, I don't think they'll mind me saying, pretty terrible with money as well. So it's very, like growing up is, was very sort of hand to mouth. If suddenly my dad had a bit of money, we would spend it. And then suddenly we, we, we haven't got anything. And it's like kind of fish finger sandwiches for a week. Um, is a real sort of personal memory of, it makes me scared of money now, I suppose. Um, uh, and then, yeah, he went and worked in a, a UPS depot. He did nights in a UPS depot about 10 years ago for five years, which, you know, because they were in a, in a position. And then my mum developed a business where she was running an after school club, which was actually financially amazing for them. And they, so yeah, my, my parents are very, they, they make it work and it, it, you know, there's this, I suppose what I've been told is called toxic positivity, which is um, my mum's comment to everything. So you could walk in, you know, broken arm, you've lost a lost a limb. And my mum will go, oh, it'll be all right. Everything will be all right. Um, which is, it's not always helpful in life. <laughs> but uh, that's my parents and my grandparents, to be honest. It was always, oh, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. And you think, but we, we this meltdown. What do we do? We fine, but and it, do you know what? Generally, it was always fine. But um, yeah, that that was how it was. They sound like really brilliant like people. It sounds very similar to my family, actually. Although my mum would say like you fail and you hurt yourself and you cry and it'd be like stop crying, dust <laughs> yourself off, get on with it. You know, it was almost like you couldn't have a pity party. Yeah, it's like yeah. we we just get on. We just don't let people get us down. Sort of mentality, and it sounds yeah. very much. Well, your parents had that in them. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't tough love. You know, it wasn't. But there was a bit of, yeah, okay, fine. Yeah, you're not going to die. Off you go. <laughs> they sound much nicer. My family is. We're born in. I'm Glaswegian though, so it's, you've got to have tough love. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 My family are kind of it's kind of tough in other ways. Whereas, you know, don't don't suffer fools and you know, kind of suspicious of everyone. Everyone's got an ulterior motive. You know, nothing's free and all that sort of thing. Um, but it was, it was great. And I think through, you know, I, I went through, a, I suppose, teenage years, just wanted to get away from them. I was actually like to my shame, embarrassed by, you know, they were, my parents were main source of income was car boot sales. That's so embarrassing. And I, I know would, and I regret it now. I would, I would lie about it. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell people, but, um, no, they're great. Now we get on that so well now it's, um, is way better than I used to be. It's not their problem, it's me with the issues. You know? Yeah. Do you know, it's actually, I totally get it. Because remember, you're telling this story from the lens of a child, yeah. not the lens of an adult. They, they're two very different things. So when your parents listen to this or your family, they don't have to be annoyed with you because you're, you're talking honestly as a kid's perspective. And I always remember my mum, like we, we, we in Claybank Shopping Centre, like, right. As you can imagine, we've got all the cheap bargain shops and the occasional denial. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's very, like, it's not a rich place, although people, you know, there's a varying of, of levels of, of money and whatever. Yeah. But it's not really about that here. But I always remember my mum would go down the shopping centre and I would be with my friends and she'd shout up, Lynn, do you want anything out of the pound shop? And you'd be like, oh, no, it was pound stretcher. And I was like, oh, my God, like, that is so embarrassing. But she, she'd done it deliberately just to wind me up because... I think the thing is, you know, when you're born and bred with nothing and you were saying like your gran lived in the slums and, you know, yeah. your family's obviously moved out, but they've never forgotten where they came from. And, yeah. you know, who doesn't love a car boot sale? My sister, Kathleen, loves a charity shop. I actually just recently read a book. It cost me 42 pence out of the charity shop and I loved well, it. It was brilliant. No, it's, it's so, so different now. And it's like, I love like going around those places and it's like brilliant. But at the time... You know, when I'd have a cut new coat for school and, uh, you know, it hadn't been bought new and nothing we had was, uh, as, we're, as kids, the four of us like, had the most amazing Christmases. But because my mum and dad, they, my mum and dad start Christmas in January. So they're literally scouring <clears throat> every sale and shop they can go to. And 
like now with their grandchildren, is amazing. But they are, they are so like they watch every penny, and so you know, my son might get a, a, something that's worth fifty quid or whatever is bought new. But I know for well my mum and dad probably haven't spent more than a tenner on it. They've they've wheeled and dealed, and you know, my dad is the greatest negotiator of all time. Um, it's um, I'm pretty unreal to watch him in action. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, he knows how to get a bargain. So it, oh, it's, good. And it hang out for me. Sounds like my kind of person. I yeah, like getting a bargain. Like, like you said about the pound shop, when you see something and you're like, Dad, I'm just going to buy this. You go, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. And you go, oh, just please, just let me buy this. I, I'll give him all the money. It's fine. It's fine. But yeah, uh, yeah, it, they, do, they do watch every penny, definitely. Do you know, and I think it's very hard to get out of that. It's obviously like a very successful son. You know, you've seen a lot of the world. You're working with the yeah. biggest brands in the world. And yet it sounds to me as if you are very grounded because of them. I don't think you are. Like, you've never struck me as being James, this egomaniac. Because I don't think your family would allow you to be like that. And I don't no. think you would. No, I think I had a phase where maybe after uni where it was... I had to definitely check myself and sort of various people on, I know where, but no, now it's not, I'm not embarrassed. I like talking about it, but I kind of have to be asked about it. I don't sort of, you know, and it's, I have a weird relationship with sort of social media is my way of communicating to my mum and dad what I've done more than anything. And they will ask me about it. It's, it's weird. It's, um, you know, my, my brothers and sisters, uh, you know, they do all right in life. But like my, my sister is, my older sister is very much like my mum and dad and makes everything count. And, you know, I'm very privileged that I found this career that I love and been able to sort of do well out of it. But also need to check myself when I, I go home. I don't want to, you don't want to show off or, do you know what I mean? It's kind of that. 100%. Slightly, slightly embarrassing. Even with like some of my mates, which still live at you know in Northampton at, at home and stuff you kind of just you are you're a different person when you go home and you kind of just forget all the sort of media nonsense that you live in day to day well yeah because it's a vanity magic isn't it? I mean it's funny you should say you know where you live now because so, so I don't know if you know this I still live in the hometown that I was brought up in working class clay I bank I think that's yeah. really cool yeah 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 so I still live there and I do a global role but I still get the cringiness I remember Years ago, oh my God, this is this is going to make me sound like a really strange person, but I think you'll get this. So we bought a house about 10 years ago. Yeah. Really, really nice. It's lovely. It's really nice. Yeah. And I mean, relative to, like, you're not going to get our type of house in London. Like, that's not going yeah. to happen. Yeah. We couldn't afford that. But I remember when I got it at first, I was almost too embarrassed to go in the gate. So what I would do is before we had the driveway, I'd park outside and I would sort of wait for people to go by. Then I'd go in my house. Yeah. And everyone's like, are you mad? Like, what, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know. I just felt for for a while, I felt really awkward about it. Now I'm cool with it and it's fine. But at yeah. that time, I thought, God, because my mum and dad always taught me, like, never get above your station, never yeah. think you're better than anybody else. And I've never thought that. But it was almost like a, a mental block for me to embrace what I had. Um, you know, I don't live my life like exuberantly. I, I'm, I live a really modest life still because that's just the way we are as people. Yeah, you yeah. probably get that, yeah. Yeah, totally. it's, yeah, absolutely get that. I think it's a weird, I don't know why we, you get so self-conscious of, yeah, and it's different for different audiences. It's um, like uh, Emma, my other half, says my accent changes when I go home and because, and it's weird, I don't speak, I don't really sound like, anyone from Northampton because I don't know it's kind of out of there I don't want to you kind of you don't I don't want people because I cringe when I hear I can pick out a Northamptonian accent a mile away and it's always when I'm in the middle of nowhere and I think oh god I can hear something it's it's really strange and yeah I actually went through the phase at university where I kind of actively really tried to tone it down and to a point where you, you get rid of it but it's like an imposter syndrome, I suppose, like what you're saying in a, a consciousness, like both ways. So when you're at home, you don't want to show off. And then when you're in, well, I found in an industry that felt very middle class and everyone was called Jacinta, when I start, kind of had to kind of right, I need to bury that away and not let them know where I'm actually from and 
and you know what yes. life actually is like I suppose and I hate feeling like that and I, I definitely do it less now but it's you're so conscious especially in this industry it's it's really really troubling See, it's really interesting you should say that because I've had a different mindset. Now, actually, people who've been on this show, many people are very similar to what you've just said. So that's not unusual to hear that. I, I don't know if I'm just, I don't know if it's a Glasgow thing or because my parents died and I was younger and my brother died. But for me, I always had a bit of a kick out of it. So for me, it was very much like um, if people, if, if someone spoke to me in the industry, I'd quite happily tell them from Claybank. I almost wore it as a badge of honour because I didn't live there. I didn't live in London. I always yeah. lived where I lived. So for me, it was always a talking point. And I kind of, I don't know, I just used to think, do you know what, if I can't get where I am because of who I am, then it's not going to happen. And so yeah. I, I maybe just, I don't know if I just didn't want it enough or I don't know. I just wanted I think, to be I think, me. I think, it's, I, think that's, I think that's a way healthier way to be. I think as of, as of we've aged and I think when we started, we worked at an agency called Big who had WKD. And then that was the first time I felt that actually knowing what I know and being where I'm from is cool because it informs this, this humour. And when we got to McCann, Manchester, we worked on Aldi, which is like such a working class brand, but like in a, such a cool way as well. And it's like, oh, I can, I've got those, I've got those jokes. I understand this audience better. And so our business now being in Manchester is completely deliberate that we feel actually we're closer to the real world than, you know, these, but I was listening to the Your Dave Trot podcast from a while back and he was talking about these, you know, kids in the middle of London and they, you know, to be a creative in London and live in that world that do most of the advertising you see, those kids have got to have like serious financial backing just to do a placement, just to live and exist. And yeah, it's a, it's definitely a badge of honour now, but to my shame, it definitely wasn't, you know, <laughs> a real imposter and uh, sort of kind of undercover in a way. Like I remember... Um, there's a couple of occasions when I think someone asked me when I was quite young into the industry, oh, do you ski? And it was like, and I, so obviously I was like, uh, yeah, I haven't for a while. Well, I've never, I don't know anyone who skied until probably 10 years ago to be like, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a troubling thing that's I've always had a, an issue with. And one of the things I want to ask you, I don't know if it's fair of me to ask this, but you brought it up, so we'll integrate it a bit more. You sort of mentioned earlier that you were embarrassed of where you grew up, and you sort of mentioned your parents as well because of the yeah. way they were. Can you just talk me through how did you feel embarrassed and, and kind of what was going through your mind as a child? Um, I suppose uh, what was it that everyone's... So my dad being a, a working in a uh, being a car mechanic, I would get dropped off at school every morning in a different car, a different old banger, basically. Um, and I remember kids; it just felt like kids had better stuff. Like it was, it was all a bit more. You know, they'd pull up in a, a nice car, and you know, they'd get out the back. Whereas, you know, there was four of us, so three of us were crammed in the back. I, you know, one of us was in the front. Yeah got to a point where I used to make my dad drop me off around the corner and it was um I suppose the embarrassment was feeling like we were very different to to what was normal right we didn't have we weren't up to the level of other people where when I look back now I think well of course we were was, I didn't know what I was focusing on um so I suppose that was that was the yeah, no, it's like other people's dads had professional jobs. And I think there was a few people I remember hanging out with um, through sport mainly where, you know, you go to their parents' house and it would be really nice. And my parents wouldn't be around to watch me play football or whatever at the weekend because they were doing like these car boot sales or whatever. So very much, I was kind of, um, you'd, I'd wake up at a weekend and I'd, it'd just be me and my brother or my sister in the house till usually the evening and you so you kind of existed and being able to you know go to other friends houses for tea and stuff uh was really nice I always felt like I couldn't do this the other way so I was desperate for them not to come to our house which I suppose a bit unusually and my, my parents house is chaos so there's boxes everywhere and it always was growing up it was whatever they my dad had bought 
would be piled up in the living room and you'd have to weave in and out of it. Um, which now when I think about it, it was like, oh, my youth was cool because it was like, it was such fun, but outside of the house. Yeah. I and yeah, like I said, I'm ashamed of it that, yeah, I wasn't, I, I didn't want anyone to know, I suppose. So yeah, it was, uh, I think my, there was, there's been, there's various times when I didn't really know what being working class was either until I remember a couple of things. I found out my school was 92nd out of 93 secondary schools in Northamptonshire for like rated. So it was, it was a dump really. <laughs> um, even though a couple of us did it. So Laura Tobin off, um, good morning. Britain is actually from the same school. So it's people still like that. Um, and there, you know, we'd even go to play sport. I remember going to play local, the the posh schools, and you know, we'd turn up in our PE kit or the one football kit the school had, which was shared between every year group. So you'd be peeling mud stuck together clothes back, and they'd arrive in their sort of track suits with their amazing emblem on it, and we'd got handwritten dust and on the side and whatever. Um, yeah, there's all these moments where I just felt it's suddenly you realise that you're you're maybe a bit different to, to whatever your benchmark is. And I think looking back my benchmarks were all out of whack, really. Yeah, do you know that's not just similar to Clay Bank, the way you describe that. You know, and our schools are very mixed. I went to Braidfield High School, which was had boarded up windows, like and right. the teachers <laughs> had breakdowns because the kids were so naughty and they just pushed yeah, them yeah. over the edge. You know, and it was really hard. Don't get me wrong, we had some gems of teachers. Yeah. Actually, one of them I'm friends with on Facebook is cool. Yeah. Yeah. But see, when you felt different, were mm. you ever picked on for that? Or did the kids ever say anything? No, I, so, I think uh, I, I was... My brothers and sisters were suffered, had tougher times at school than I did. I think um, I was never picked on. Uh, I think for a couple of reasons, I think my go given especially where my mum's side of the family come from everyone's pretty tough and i think my mum is lovely and a lovely cuddly grandma now but there's a tough undercurrent and it's kind of um you know we don't you kind of you're very quick to work out where the trouble is and i think I found that in later life out with what you call middle class friends in Manchester and someone's being a bit leery, they're all panicking and you kind of suddenly feel like the only one who's able to deal with this situation or whatever. Um, yeah, I think at school I was also, I was good at sport. So I played sport, uh, football, rugby, uh, basketball, athletic, all of it for at least one year, if not two years above where I was. Um, which definitely, I mean, me and one of my best friends did the same, uh, still my best friend now. Um, and it stopped us getting, it got us out of so much trouble. It's like, oh, don't leave them alone. They play football for us or they're good at football. And it was being good at sport was um, definitely a free pass at my school. Got you respect, uh, which was, yeah, yeah really strange, right? Yeah. I don't think it is strange. It's funny. So in our school, I'm going to be non-PC now, but in our school, the currency of being popular was being good at sport. I was none of those. I was very good. If you were a girl, <laughs> you had big boobs, right. which I didn't have. Right. And just being in being a nez, like basically being like pure, like, you know, you know what I mean? Like a chav, right. think you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, but if you were one of those three things, people liked you, they thought you were cool in different yeah. ways. And, and unfortunately, I didn't take any of the three boxes. Oh no, oh, damn it, damn it. So I did get, yeah, I did get bullied. So I'm so jealous you were good at sport, damn. I mean, I yeah. did go on to do martial arts, but that was a bit too late because I yeah, actually you had that, done it. Then. Yeah, I could have done it for them. I know. And so for you then, you know, you're talking about, so your school was a bit of a dump, totally yeah. get it, same yeah. wavelength here. You, but you were good at sport. So academically, how did you perform? Uh, academically, I did pretty well. So uh, sort of A's, B's, C's, I suppose. Um, but kept my head down. I didn't want, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell those people that I'm in this. And it's kind of, I suppose you had to be a bit of a comedian where there's certain groups where 
you might be a bit different around where deep down all I wanted to do was think, actually, I can I can probably get an A in this class because I think I'm better than that. And it was about being other people, which is another weird thing in my psyche, which is definitely not a thing now so much, but it's kind of, you know, outworking people. We were always told that um, I was always very much encouraged by my grandfather, uh, you know, that told that you know you're smart you need to study you need to get to university because no one in the family had ever been to I was the first um and my brothers and uh, my sister my youngest sister did get in but stopped after a a term maybe um but yeah so there was always that goal of wanting to be right in order one way out of not one way out sounds so dramatic but it's kind of get to university and that is then there's prosperity after that so uh, my mum's sister uh, Kathleen uh, married my uncle Andrew had a, who had a degree and I would see him and his nice uh, Audi 80 or whatever it was and think oh that's I've got to do what he's done um, so I was given good role models I suppose and you know told what to do and you know seize every opportunity and you know never I suppose never let anyone make you think you're not good enough and it's it's, it's it kind of drives you on. And I think to what we do now, being out of London for most of our careers um, definitely makes you work harder, I think. Yeah. For sure, yeah. The underdog, I mean, it's it's a typical underdog story, what you're describing. You know, you've got family, you love them dearly, so there's no question of how you loved your family. But the, no, the whole I'm embarrassment sure that piece... Might, so I'm sure, anyway. <laughs> but, you know, it's the embarrassment piece, isn't it? It's like you... you you've, you exactly what you're saying your competitive edge sounds to me as if it came from the fact that you were different you didn't have what everybody had but you knew that if you if you could get this part right which actually is a really smart thing for someone of your age at that time you know if you could do this you could get your way out I mean what did you study at uni? Uh, Well this is a game because no one had ever been to university so I would never advise my kids to do this but I did a degree in music industry management and marketing because I suppose I was at a sweet spot when Britpop started and it was, you know, blurring oasis, which actually made it cool to be working class and have an accent. It made me desperate. It almost made me fall in love with Manchester actually at the time. Um, and sort of the dream of what that could be. Um, but yeah, I did that. Uh, I blagged my way uh, to do work experience at a company called Pop Tones, which was basically creation records, which was, oasis so it's all my record industry heroes um and i again just whilst at uni i talked my way into doing press release uh doing review album reviews uh gig reviews which meant i got free tickets and free cds um which then uh, pop tones let me write press releases for the hives so it's like 19-year-old kid writing for their biggest band and somehow con someone and go, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I'm, I know how to do that. And that's kind yeah. of the story of it, really. But I hated the record industry as soon as I was in it because it was drugs everywhere. It was lots of spreadsheets. And I felt that I this wasn't me. It didn't, didn't feel like me. Though I was obsessed with music at the time and, you know, had really shit haircuts and all of it. <laughs> I see drugs and spreadsheets are two things I don't tend to put together, but that's really interesting. That's right. It's just shifting products, but it's kind of a yeah. sexy product, I suppose. But it's, I know it, what you mean. I mean, but what's interesting, and you sort of didn't elaborate, I'd love you to, you yeah. talked about how you blagged your way in. Well, what does yeah. that mean? How did you do it? I think I can, uh, I suppose it's like just be yourself and let your, your natural passion come across. So it's yeah. like, I suppose in my head, I get, I really want to do this. So I'm just going to, I'm going to talk at you until you let me do it. And um, it was just, just convincing me that I had no qualification to do this stuff, but I think I'd I'd read enough to know what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So you wrote uh, to them? Did you write to them or phone them? uh, I've, I've wrote to them, then phoned them and then probably suggested that why don't I come in for an interview? rather than be invited. And it's the same way I got into the ad industry was um, I had no portfolio when I went to BNB, which was the first agency I ever worked for. Um, and so went to the pub with a guy and my knowledge of Led Zeppelin, talking about the band Led Zeppelin for an hour, 
kind of got to the point where you go, oh, I like you. You can, you can start on Monday and that's it. I've never looked back. I haven't got any formal education in this industry, um, which now I think actually the best people are the, I, of course I would say this, but the people that haven't had that, you know, haven't been shown how to do it from a textbook. You've kind of worked it out for yourself and it's, it's done us all right. Tim's similar in that he, he's not qualified in advertising. He's got a design degree, but, um, yeah, it's, that's kind of how we've done a lot of stuff. So it's a lot of, even our approach to how we get clients now is, uh, right. If I've got, you've got to be in it to win it. So I'm not just going to sit here and go, I wish we could design the red nose one day. I'm just going to ask you if I can do it. And oh, what's the worst you're going to do? Say no. Wow. Well, you've definitely got your dad's hustle mentality. I mean, yeah, it sounds exactly. to me yeah. as if what, what they even parted on you is obviously knowledge of the world, but actually you're a talker. I had no yeah. idea you didn't have qualifications. So I just wrongly assumed or rightly, it doesn't, but you know, but I just assumed that you had maybe went to art college or, or done, but I, yeah. So you basically came in, went into this industry. So you, look, let's get this right then. So if I've got the paths correctly, so you were at uni, you then get, get the chance to work in the music industry by blagging your way and just by basically yeah. positioning yourself as the right guy for yeah. a job they didn't even have. Yeah. And then from there, was that your then your first job in the agency after that? Yeah, so be, uh, so I realised music wasn't something I wanted to do. Didn't really enjoy the degree at the end. It was it, In hindsight, it was a waste of time. It was, um, though, <sighs> annoyingly, it was... Uh, I was the first year not to get a grant, but I, it was means tested, so I didn't pay fees. But I had this huge loan, which I just utterly wasted on stuff. <laughs> I've got nothing to show for it. Um, but yeah, so B and B was my first job, and I just and I, I had a part of the degree was marketing, so I thought marketing, oh, I can write a bit. I wonder what's writing and where I'm going to make something. And um, yeah, it was. Adver- I applied for a grad scheme at. Uh, uh, what was, uh, what were they called? Uh, BMP DDB, which is basically Adam and Eve now, which didn't get, an, I didn't get an interview for. It must have been the work, it was for account management, which is, is not me <laughs> remotely. I don't know. I would have been awful. Um, but yes, I just sort of fell into it. But it was also falling out of love with music. I did, um, I got to the last three people on the grad scheme at, uh, to, in the interview at the grad school at Universal Records, which was like, right, this is it. I'm going to get a big corporate job now. The money was like seven grand a year. And this is only like 2002. So seven grand a year. Then you cannot live in London on seven grand a year 20 years ago. Um, and again, I suppose this has got pertinence to what we, this podcast really, that I was sat in the room with music industry degree, had the experience of, working at pop tones had managed bands and set up my own band management business, which kind of sort of made money and the bands did all right. Um, and I was sat next to someone who'd been to Oxford and studied Russian and French and it, like your heart sinks. You think, ah, oh, I'm not, I'm never getting this because that person, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, that was, I mean, that was a real realization and then knew I had to do something else. So then, Apply to B and B on it's on read.co.uk, the early days of read or something, just searching desperately. I'd filled out actually an application to be um a policeman, um, the grad scheme at the NHS. And that I couldn't think of anyone worse to do those jobs now. It's like, why on earth? But I was just I needed a career, I needed to find my thing and yeah, fell into this industry. Um yeah, and it's been great ever since. Yeah, it's worked out. Yeah, do you know? Do you know what kind of bugs me? You know when people talk about, you know, especially young people now, and they'll go, I mean, you know, it's not about the skills; it's about the passion, right? And I yeah. get that because it's not always about the skills you can learn yeah. them. But see this passion thing; it sort of bugs me a bit because see where I'm from and where you were from, the passion people have is to pay the mortgage or pay the rent, to have a bit a few pounds to go for a dinner. To, and you're like, how do you expect young people to have a passion? So what was really cool about you is obviously you you did were lucky to have a you know a liking of of music. But I bet it wasn't until you were a bit older and then you get into advertising, you're like, oh actually now you get a passion because you're yeah. in it and you live it. But but where you were from, I bet you 
that was never even a possibility that was a passion because you wouldn't have known no i didn't even know it was a job to be honest and it was like <laughs> oh, how do you get into a position where you're writing tv ads it's it's it felt so exotic and to be honest it wasn't until i was in the agency doing press ads that i realized that oh yeah we do tv as well so you might get a tv brief and it was like what the fuck what really <laughs> um so yeah and then you then so then my mindset is right give me a tv brief as soon as you can and um, oh, exactly now you ask for it like you don't wait to be asked you're like i'll do the red nose and i want the the tv campaign <laughs> we try we do live on the like it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission kind of thing um yeah it kind of it carries you well i think that sort of attitude it does and i have to ask because i was going to ask earlier but we went on a different tangent can you play an instrument if you went to do music uh no so i did well I, at the time i'm a i'm a so i've got can you say three guitars um so i've got four guitars actually uh and i can play a lot of chords um but I have I don't have a great memory, so I've got ADHD, so I can't really I don't recall the mute. But I can if you show me the music in front of me, I can play it quickly. Um, but no, I'm not a musician. But that's uh, again all sort of self taught, sort of around sort of mid nineties. Bands are cool, right? How do I get a girl? Oh right, I'll, if I play a guitar, maybe that I won't have to dance or whatever. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, that will impress her. Yeah, yeah. So the ADHD thing, that's yeah. really interesting because what I'm starting to see a lot of is people that have ADHD actually are very creative people and they, they think differently. And so do you would you say in a way your ADHD is a bit of a superpower? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think you suddenly run the, the creative departments in ad industry. There's, I think um, it's like 50% is neurodiverse in some way. Uh, but yeah, it was a, I think it definitely is. I think without realising it, um, so I've only known about it for about three years. Um, and it explains a lot of sort of the chaos. So you can't see now my desk is a nightmare right now. And I'm leaning on bits of paper with notes on and getting pen all over my hand. Um, but yeah, the, the ability to sort of take two very sort of advertising is one and one equals three so it's like taking two concepts putting them together and you make a new one just to get weird stuff like that and my recall of conversations that um you know i might have overheard in a garden center cafe or something versus all oh, right here's a tambourine or whatever it is it's it's just all a bit whizzy but it kind of, it kind of works which is why also i need tim is a good so tim's a lot i suppose a lot straighter and it's why that working partnership works so well it's we i think we really we really complement each other and we fit together quite nicely yeah you definitely bring different things to the party so I, again i didn't know that and i, I just but you know i find it really fascinating and th there was another thing you mentioned earlier yeah. you mentioned seeing a therapist yeah do you want yeah. to talk about that uh i won't go too much into it but i suppose it's just uh, a few years ago just had to check myself and um it was really interesting to get to the bottom of why i behaved or reacted in certain ways so um part of my uh part of the issues were the toxic positivity that i talked about with uh, with my mum and dad which they know all about which probably didn't help but i used to isolate myself a lot so if I got into an argument or things were stressful, I'd kind of disappear. Sounds dramatic, but as a kid, I spent a lot of time upstairs away from the rest of the family door shut. Um, and I was finding I was doing it in adulthood as well, I suppose, in terms of not shutting myself away, but I'm just not going to talk to anyone. I'm going to, I'm not going to answer any emails. I'm just going to sit and feel sorry for myself and, and let things fester. But, I suppose a healthier way to be mentally is to now I'm, a conflict resolution is like I'm I'm on it and yeah sort of get out of there quickly because this is I this could be me for days deciding not to talk to anyone so yeah yeah but you're you're as a kid I suppose I would be described as moody um, but yeah there was I suppose there was you know and it's like 
I was always told everyone's parents messes them up in some way and you, you can't help it. Even like my kids will be something which I'm doing, which will affect them one day. Um, but it's really, really great actually. And yeah, therapy I'd recommend to anyone. It's, it's amazing. I'm kind of sort of addicted to it. I haven't done it for a little while, but, um, yeah, I love it. Oh, there you go. Some people say this is like therapy, you know, like even that during the podcast series. Yeah. I don't know if you feel like that. You'll be going off going, damn, I can't believe you asked that. It's but... the chest, actually. I feel, oh, yeah, that's that's why I felt like that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I think the thing is, James, you know, when you look at what you've achieved now, I mean, I, I don't think we can underestimate and play down where you are and, and the level you are in the industry. So, you know, for people tuning in, like you do work with some of the biggest brands in the world, which, you know, name some of them, like some brands that we would know. Uh, so we, so uh, the BBC was where we spent uh, from 2017 to 2022. So the BBC is obviously a massive one and we won, uh, we won a BAFTA, which was uh, amazing. Uh, but right now uh, we are working with Travel Supermarket, um, Chester Zoo, uh, Iceland, um uh some people i'd love to say something but i actually thought i can't say that <laughs> right oh you've won a piece of business <laughs> yeah. right oh uh, uh, <laughs> just designed the noses for red nose day which was a real coup for us uh and in the past harley davidson Vauxhall, yeah yeah there's loads of them but there's uh, so many yeah, yeah like, and, i mean so, so the reason what you're talking about you're saying it now it's like yeah that's not bad well done yeah. Well, it is. And, you know, the, the, the reason I was asking is it's sort of leading me somewhere is because when you think of your childhood now yeah. and you, you look at where you are today, yeah, what what goes through your mind of where how where you were and where you are now? Uh, it's often it's the reactions. That it's, it's a bit, uh, excuse me, I'm going to swear, but it's like, how the fuck did that happen? What? What? And you, there's certain times when, you know, you might be sat in the reception at a, production company and you're thinking my god like even 10 years ago i couldn't believe i was here um the the real mo it's like it's there's real humbling moments so we did the rebrand of bbc one for example and that the the eye dents on bbc one have played every day and will be for the next five years knowing that that's in everyone's living room now is that's that's amazing but um it's it's a different planet but I think what what keeps you grounded is that I remember the the journey and I remember every single thing we've done and I can look back now that you know or oh, if I, if we so if Tim and I for example we uh, the first bit of TV we wrote was for WKD um, and the um, Clearcast or the ASA or whatever said oh no this script is not approved because it's um, I think it was like childish behaviour or something like that. Which he was, um, and then we were told by CD, no, "It's not going." Sorry, guys, the client loves it, but it's not going to run. Um, so we took it upon ourselves to write a, a physical letter and send it, saying, "This is why you are wrong." And then, lo and behold, a week later, got a letter back saying, "Okay, it's approved." That those sort of moments are you can think, right? If that hadn't have happened, we wouldn't have got the job at McCann. And all these amazing sort of close calls and. Uh, good decisions and bad decisions that have kind of worked themselves out and here we are. Sounds as if it was meant to be, well, and I guess, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you think back now, you know, are your parents proud of you, like your parents yeah. and your family? Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. I mean, don't talk about it. My mum and dad, are, they they love it. When, when we, um, I don't want to go on about it, but when we won the BAFTA, my mum had it at her house for about a month and was taking it to, you know, if she was going to Costa or something, the BAFTA was going in a bag alongside, and she'd be getting out showing her friends. And, yeah, they're super proud. And I don't think they always completely understand what we do. Um, yeah. they don't, you know, it's like I, I don't know if they can un work out, you know, what. but what do you do? It's like, oh, we sit for a few days and try and come up with something. <laughs> or, you know, my grandfather was – I remember once I came, went to my – the grandparents house after work and in advertising you kind of dress as you are and he was like do you do you, do you get to work like that do you do you not put a tie on and he's like no I've never put a tie on since school um 
yeah, it's uh, they're very proud, and they, yeah, they they let me know, which is which is good. That's really good. Well, the one thing I'd say in all of that is I'm so glad you never left the BAFTA for long, and it might have been gone in the car boot sale. <laughs> well, yeah, there'd be uh, there'd be some sort of cash for gold scheme that my dad have worked out and thought, oh, why don't why don't you have this fifty pounds instead? You can do so much more with it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly well do you know what I mean I think you're an absolute inspiration because if you think oh. about it you know where where you've came from and you know the difficulties that not just you that like anybody faces as you say every parent in some way shape or form has messed a kid up I'm sure they have and I'm sure yeah. I'm equally as guilty of that but you know I think when you you look at where you've come from the kind of life that you had and, and I guess the envy you felt of friends and others yeah. and you, you can't help but but feel how, how you feel. But when you look at the journey you've taken, and I think the sort of big learning for me, and I don't know if you would agree, would be a lot of it's around the hustle. It's the hustle. It's not being frightened. It's like, what have I got to lose? I might yeah. as well ask for forgiveness. And I just think your both your parents and your family set you up really well. So my ask to you is, I think you continue to where, where you came from as a badge of honour, because I think oh, if, if you yeah, didn't I come from there, I don't think you'd be as successful. No, then. exactly. No, don't don't ask, don't get. Is is we were told that all the time. So it's uh... exactly. Well, I'm going to ask next time we catch up. The rounds on you, right? So... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll sell <laughs> something so I can buy you the phone. <laughs> I don't care. Just manage it somehow. All right. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much, and yeah. thanks for being part of this. You're welcome. It's, it was lovely. It was therapy in itself. <laughs>